In this chapter, we will be studying sequences and series. In this lesson, we will be looking at geometric sequences. All right, hi everybody. So now we're going to take a look at geometric sequences. Okay, so previously we had done arithmetic sequences and the, the trick to that one here is we've got this pattern of numbers where we're either adding or subtracting some constant value to go to the next term. In a geometric sequence or, or series here, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply or divide just to get to the next term here. And when we do that, okay, we call that number that we're going to multiply or divide by the common ratio. And you'll, you'll see why here in just a second. So let's just take a look at a little example here. So you've got the sequence 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. Well, what am I doing to go from 2 to 4, and then 4 to 8, then 8 to 16? Well, I'm multiplying by 2. I know that's what I'm doing here because if I take the second term divided by the one previous to it, I get 2. If I take the third term divided by the second term, I get 2. So it's this common value that is this ratio of the two terms. That's, that's why we call it the common ratio, okay? If we have the, the uh, sequence 4, 12, 36, 108, again, if we want to know what that common ratio is, it's going to be 12 over 4 which would be the same as 36 over 12, which would be the same as 108 over 36. And regardless of what pair you take, if you take the, the later term divided by the previous term, you get 3. The common ratio for this one here is going to be 3. Now, we're not going to go through the process of, of really deriving this, this for you uh, because the derivation is very, very similar to what you saw in the um, arithmetic sequences. Okay? But know that our formula is going to be the nth term is going to equal the first term multiplied by the ratio to the n minus 1. So just like in the, in the arithmetic sequence, how we would add that common difference, but we would add n minus 1 of them. So if you're looking for the 10th term, you would add 9 differences. If you're looking for the 20th term, you'd add 19 differences. Here, we're going to multiply by that common ratio, but n minus 1 times. Okay? So there's our, there's our formula. The different pieces, T sub 1, remember that's our first term. R is the common ratio. N is the number of terms or the, the term number, if you will. Okay, because you could have an infinite number of terms, let's say, but let's say you're only looking for like the 10th term or the 100th term or whatever. And then T sub N is the nth term or, or if it's a finite sequence and you're looking for how many there are, that's the last term. Okay, but remember this is all, that T sub N, that is all together one one symbol, one variable, okay? Now, one thing that you should, should know here, you should be able to, uh, to recognize this. Uh, from the other lesson, when we took a look at arithmetic sequences, we noticed that the, the points, again, they're discrete values. They're little dots that show up on the graph here. Here's the first term, second term, third term, fourth term, and so on. And they go up in a straight line, okay? These are, these are linear, okay? These arithmetic sequences. Now, they don't always have to be going up. They could actually be going down. But anyway, they're going to be a straight line. Geometric, on the other hand, oh, it's got this curve right here. First term, second term, third term. And then all of a sudden, the differences start to get larger and larger and larger very, very quickly. Okay? Uh, this is what we call geometric growth, by the way. And if you want a word to describe that, it's not, it's not linear in this case. It's what we would call exponential. Okay? So geometric growth or exponential growth, kind of one and the same thing here. But it's going to be, it's not going to be a straight line graph. It's going to grow very, very quickly. Or on the other hand, it could be dropping down very, very quickly and then it slows down. Uh, if, it's, if it's a graph that's getting smaller as you go on here, it'll be drop really, really quickly and then it'll, it'll get slower and slower and slower as you go along there. But either way here, that's going to be what we call exponential growth. Now. Let's take a look at some examples of the formula and, and how we, we will give you certain parts of it. We're going to ask you for other parts. All right. So in our first example here, we're told to find the common ratio, the general term, and then the eighth term of the following sequences. Okay. Well, to start off with our common ratio, okay, we're going to take the second term divided by the first term here, we're going to get negative 5. Now, you should know that when a sequence does this, when your common ratio is negative, we call this an alternating sequence. Okay, alternating because 
we go from negative to positive, negative to positive, or positive, negative, positive, negative, either way, we're switched signs as we go from term to term. Now I can see right now that the first term is going to be negative 1. I know that the r is negative 5. So the general term of my sequence, t sub n, is going to be negative 1 multiplied by negative 5. Now again, because it's the general term I'm looking for, I don't specify the value of n. I leave it as n, so to the n minus 1. Now, I also want the eighth term. So it's going to be negative 1 multiplied by negative 5 to the 8 minus 1. Okay, so we got negative 5, and we're going to take that to the power of 7. Okay, well, we're going to get a big number here. That's going to be negative 78,125. And putting that negative through from the, the first term, we get 78,125. Whoops, you can't see that. I'm sorry, you can't see any of that work that I'm doing right there. Okay? Now, sorry, let's just take a look at the next one here. Whoops. Uh, in this case right here, 32, 16, 8. If we take the second term and divide it by the first term, uh, notice in this case that we're getting uh, a fraction, one half, and this is because we've got kind of a decaying sequence here. Okay? The value is getting, getting smaller and smaller and smaller, so it's kind of a decaying thing. Our first term is 32. Our R value here is 1 half. So our general term, Tn, will be 32 multiplied by 1 half. Again, because I, I don't, this is the general term. I'm not specifying uh, the, which term in the sequence, so I just leave it as N. Now, if I want the eighth term, that'll be 30, sorry, if I want the eighth term, I'll do it down here, eight, 32 multiplied by one half, okay, to the eight minus one. And so that's going to be 32 multiplied by one half, basically just up to the seven, okay? So that's gonna be 32, really, multiplied by one over two to the seven, and that is going to end up being, uh, this, is, this is 2 to the 5th. 32 is 2 to the 5th, so it's going to be 1 over 2 squared. And again, you can't see that, uh, 1 over 4. That's the 8th term, which makes sense. Again, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, over here, 5, 5 root 3, 15. Okay, so r is going to be the second term divided by the first term. Okay, well, 5 divided by 5 is going to be 1. It's going to leave me with root 3. Okay, so this can be a little intimidating when you get this, this uh, radical in there as my r value. But it, it just looks a little intimidating. I'm going to treat this exactly the same here. I know that my first term is 5. I know that my r is root 3. So my nth term is going to be 5 multiplied by root 3. Again, because I, I am not specifying a term. And I know I keep saying that. I, for some of you, if it, that gets annoying, uh, that's okay. I'd rather it was annoying than surprising. If every time I say that, it comes across as a, oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, then we've got a problem here. But if, if you're starting to get annoyed by that, good, good. That means you get it, you're anticipating it. So I don't know which term it is, so I put the n in there. Now, if I want the eighth term, this is going to be 5 multiplied by root 3 to the 8 minus 1, or root 3 to the 7. Now, okay, that's going to be, okay, root, root 3 to the 7 here. That's, uh, that's like saying the square root of 3 to the 7. I am going to be able to make this 5 multiplied by the square root of 3 to the 6 multiplied by 3. Now, that is going to be 3 cubed when I pull that out. So 5 multiplied by 3 cubed, that's the square root of 3 to the 6 multiplied by the square root of 3. I can't pull that extra 3 out. And then I'm going to have 5 multiplied by 3 cubed. Now that's 135 root 3. That would be the eighth term of that sequence. Okay, so a lot going on in those first, those first few questions there. Let's take a look at another one. Uh, given the sequence, 32, 64, 128, blah, 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 up to 16,384, we're going to find the number of terms. Okay. Well, this is the last term in the sequence. If I knew what the n was for this one right here, I would know the number of terms in the sequence. Okay, 
So we gotta build, we're gonna build the general term here. So the first term is 32, that's not a problem. The R value is gonna be the second term divided by the first term. So it's gonna be two. So I can build my general term. Tn is gonna be 32 multiplied by two to the n minus one. Yeah, again, general, because I'm not specifying the, the term right now. Now, I do know that the last term of the sequence is 16,384. So I'm going to put that in for my TN, 16,384. What I don't know is the N value associated with that term. Okay. Well, I'm going to solve this. Now, I'm, I'm going to be fairly limited in my ability to solve this, I'll be honest with you. Uh, until you get to math, uh, or the next level of math, where you start looking at something called a logarithm, the questions that you're dealing with here are either going to be very straightforward or going to require a calculator and a graphical solution where you're going to like graph the two, the two sides of the equation, look for the point of intersection. In this particular case here, I'm going to divide by 32 to simplify this down and I will get 512 is equal to 2 to the n minus 1. If 512 is a power of 2, then I'm okay. If it's not, then I'm going to have to plug in both sides of this, this equation in my calculator and graph those and look for a point of intersection. But it turns out in this case that 512 is in fact a, a multiple of 2, which I'm sorry, a, a power of 2, which is great. So 512 can be written as 2 to the 9. You can, you can play with that and verify that for yourself. That's equal to 2 to the n minus 1. So because I've got power equal to power, the bases are the same, they're both 2. Therefore, the exponents must also be equal to each other. That's the only way I can maintain equality here. Bring the one over, and we get that n for that last term, the n, the tenth, sorry, the n for that last term is 10. So therefore, there are 10 terms, right? If that's what the n value is for the last term, that's how many terms there are total. Let's look at this next one. I'm telling you that the third term here is 12, and the seventh term is 192. And I want to find, okay, I want to find A. Now, we've been pretty consistent about that. We're going to call that T1 instead. Okay, that's just a, right now, there's, there's a change in the notation. They're trying to be pretty consistent about using the T, uh, but that A was just a kind of a, a leftover from before here, where A represented the first term. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can you can set this one up here. Uh, I am trying to look for the first term and then the 14th term. Now, what I've got, now, that 14th term there, once, once you've got the, the first term and whatnot, like, that should be pretty straightforward to, to get that. Um, let's do this right here. I know the seventh term is 192. Okay, I know that. I know that that is going to equal the first term multiplied by the common ratio. Now notice this, I know this is the seventh term. So my exponent here would normally be to the seven minus one or, or to the six. Okay, so there we go. It's gonna be T1 R to the sixth. Okay, well that didn't give me a lot of information. Let's look at this other one here, T3. And I knew that that was 12. And I also know that the, the, the formula that I would use for that would be T1, the first term, multiplied by the common ratio. This would be to the 3 minus 1 or to the 2. Now, at first, it doesn't look like there's a lot of information. And you might wonder why I put the, that T7 on top here. Okay, but you're going to see in just a second why I chose to do that. There, there is method in my madness here. Okay? Now, if you think back to what you would have done in a, in a previous course where you solved systems of equations, what we would normally done in the past is we would, would have added or subtracted the two equations to get rid of uh, variables that we, we didn't want to deal with at that moment. And we simplified the expression and, and solved for the variable that remained. We are going to do something very, very similar here, except that my terms are all multiplied, or my factors are all multiplied together here. So instead of adding and subtracting these two equations, we are going to divide them. So on the left-hand side here, this 192 divided by 12, well, it turns out that's 16. Now, T1 divided by T1 is 1. That's wonderful. R to the 6th divided by R squared is R to the 4th. Fantastic. 
Now, in order for me to figure out what r is, I simply have to take the fourth root of both sides of this equation. Now, I already know it's going to get me r here. But if I write it like this, I have missed something significant here. Because the fourth root of, of 16 isn't just 2, which is what this looks like. This could be positive or negative 2. If I take the negative, negative 2 and raise it to the fourth power, I will get positive 16. So both positive and negative 2 actually work here. And I'm going to have to consider both of those. So r is either positive or negative 2. Now, let's see if we can use that information okay, to figure out what the first term is, because we're still not quite there yet. Uh, let's take a look at the, the, second, sorry, this, the first one that was given to us here, the t3. Let's look at this little equation. Because remember how it works. When you solve a system of equations, once you get one variable, you just go back up to, to one of your two equations and, then, and use that to, to solve for the thing that you don't know. So let's go back to this one right here. Let's say that 12 is equal to t1, and we're going to take positive or negative 2 and square it. Now, I feel totally okay plugging in both the positive and the negative 2 here because when I square that, in both cases, I'm going to get positive 4, whether it was positive 2 or negative 2. So it was irrelevant which one I chose there. And now to get the t1, I will divide both sides by 4, and I get that t1 is equal to 3. So that was the very first thing that I wanted to. I wanted to find T1. Good. Now, T14, okay, that is going to be the first term multiplied by R, now plus or minus 2, I don't know, to the 14 minus 1. Okay? Now, that's going to be 3 multiplied by positive or negative 2 to the 13. I want you to think about this. There's a reason why we were asking, we're asking for the, the 14th term. Okay, because if, if you've done this, this right here, you'll notice that there are two possible values to this. Because we're taking positive or negative 2 to the 13, that 13 is going to keep the negative if the negative's there. Okay, and if it's not there, then it'll just be positive anyway. But that 13 is going to to leave that negative behind if we use it. Now, that's why asking for the 14th term, we'll know if you've done the, the R value correct. Because the answer here, okay, is going to be 3 multiplied by, well, that could be uh, positive or negative 2 to the 13. That's going to be positive or negative 8,192. And when you multiply that by 3, you can get positive or negative 24,576. Now, if we had asked you for like the 13th term or the 15th term, then what would happen is the exponent on the R would have been an even number and the negative would have gone away. And we would never have known for sure whether or not you actually figured out the R correctly. So because we're getting these two values here, we know that you did the R, the R, R properly. Okay? This is a good question. This is a really good question. Let's keep going. Okay x plus 3 and x squared plus x minus 6 are two consecutive terms of a geometric sequence. We want to find the common ratio and the next term. Okay. Okay, well, r is going to be the, the second term divided by the first term. Now, I, I've watched all sorts of students. They get all kind of freaked out by, by how uh, this looks. As soon as you start throwing polynomials in there, they're like, well, I'm not dealing with numbers. I don't even know what the number is. How does this work here? Yeah, yeah okay, well, yeah, that's, that's true. But if you did know what the numbers were, and I asked you for the common ratio, what would you do? Like, if you knew that this was 5 and this was 10, what would you do? Well, to get R, you would take this number and divide this number. Okay, okay. So take that polynomial, divide it by that polynomial. Now, in the course that we're in right now, in particular, as soon as you see that, our x squared plus x minus 6, you should know that you're going to have to factor that. Okay, this will be x, this will be x. Uh, and to get a, po a sum of positive 1 where the product is negative 6, this is going to be plus 3 minus 2. Oh, well, x plus 3 divided by x plus 3 is going to be 1, so long as x isn't equal to negative 3. Okay, but that'll be 1. 
which will cancel and leave me with x minus 2. So that's my common ratio. Now granted, I don't know exactly what it is in terms of a number, but that's the expression that it has to be. Now, to get the next term, let's see how this works here. Well, the first term was x plus 3. To get the second term, okay, and I know that that was my numerator, I took x plus 3, multiplied that by x minus 2. So to get the next term, I'm simply going to multiply by x minus 2 again. So that's my third term here. Now, I, I think it should be clear that obviously we want you to do a little bit more than that. Okay, okay, so our third term is going to be, we all, I already know what x plus 3 times x minus 2 is. That was given to me in the problem. That was the second term, x squared plus x minus 6. Now I'm going to multiply that by, by x minus 2. Let's see what we get here. That'll be x cubed minus 2x squared plus x squared minus 2x minus 6x plus 12. And now grouping together like terms, well, there's only one cubic term, and that's going to be negative x squared, and I put together the two quadratic terms, minus 8x plus 12. And there we go. That would be the third term. Now notice, I, I can do all of this without knowing specifically what the numbers are just by, by applying the, the rule that I know is established. If I know the second term and the first term, to get R, I just divide them, regardless of whether numbers or, or polynomial expressions. Now, you might not be particularly happy with that, but at least I hope you see what you got to do. Once I know what r is, for me to get the next term, I simply multiply that second term by r. Now granted, r is a binomial. The second term is a trinomial. So when I multiply them together, it's going to take a little bit of effort. But you should know what to do. Okay, that shouldn't be a surprise to you. Let's take a look at another question. The sixth term is 20 root 2, and r is equal to root 2. Find the first term. Okay, well, I know that the first term is part of every general expression, so let's, let's do this here. So Tn is going to equal T1 uh, multiplied by, in, well, in this case, R, well, let's do R to the N minus 1. Okay, that's, I know that that's what the formula is. Now, if I want the sixth term, I already know that's going to be 20 root 2. So 20 root 2 is going to equal the first term multiplied by root 2 Okay, to the 6 minus 1. There's to the n minus 1. So this is going to be 20 root 2 is going to equal the first term. Okay, that's going to be root 2 to the 5. So it's like square root of 2 to the 5th. Okay, well, square root of 2 to the 5th. Well, that's the same as, okay, 2 to the 5th is the same as 2 to the 4 multiplied by 2. Square root of 2 to the 4 is going to be 2 squared, or, or, or 4, really. And I still have this 2 that's left over inside there that I, I can't get rid of. Now, if I try to solve for t1, I see my root 2 divided by my root 2 goes away. 20 divided by 4 gets me 5. Ah, my first term is 5. That was kind of a nice one, actually. Let's look at another one. The number of fish decreased by 5% each year in a lake. Oh, that's a tricky one. And in fact, that's, this is the kind of question that's going to immediately catch people if they're, not, if they're not paying attention. Let's keep moving here. In January 2012, there were 2,500 fish. How many will be expected in January 2017? Okay. That, okay. So first of all, we're going to take a look at this. It's going to be Tn is going to equal T1R to the n minus 1. So now here's, here's the trick here. The number of fish in the, in the lake here is going to be, first of all, the first term is 2,500. We are starting in 2012. Here's where I anticipate there might be some problems here. We are decreasing by 5%. But the ratio here, when you multiply by the, the ratio here, it always tells you how much is left, not how much you've lost, okay? 
So if I'm losing 5% every year, that means I maintain 95%. So the number that should go here is 0.95, okay? You need to be really aware of that because on an exam, if something like this was a multiple choice, we already know that a, a large number of people are going to put the number 0 0.05 there without, without giving it much thought. Now what that means is this is something terrible is happening in that, happening in that lake if 95% if of the fish die and all you're left with is 5% every year. Okay, now this question is also interesting for another reason because what's N? Okay, what's N? We go from 2012 to 2017. What's N? Now, it's very easy to say, oh, well, hey, 2017 minus 2012 is 5. N is 5. We're looking for the fifth term. That's not actually true. Okay? 2017 happens five years later, which means 2017 is the sixth term. N is actually six in this case. Now, if you're wondering where the heck that's coming from, it's because the term numbers don't always match up with the numbering system that we're given, particularly when we're given, giving you the, the numbers in years. So watch this. Here's 2012, okay? This is 2013, 14, 15, 16, and here's 17. So this is term one. Bear in mind, 2012, this is when we start. This is the first term. Second, third, fourth, fifth is right here at 2016. Uh, this is the sixth at 2017. So we are actually looking for the sixth term, 2,500, 0 0.95. Sorry, this is to the n minus 1. This will end up being to the 6 minus 1. Now, here's where that 5 comes into play. Okay, you're not wrong in understanding that the exponent has got to be 5. You, you would be wrong if you assumed that the n, the term number, is 5. Okay, because if you thought the n was 5, then you would have put a 4 up here, and then, and then you'd have been wrong there. And so we get 1,934.45 dot, dot, dot. Now, we're talking about fish in a lake here. How do we round that? I mean, this portion of a fish, do we round that up or do we round that down? Well, turns out there's statistical reasons to assume that it doesn't really matter whether you round that up or down. So I think for the most part, what you're going to do is just round to the nearest hole. But I tell you what, if this was ever a question that dealt with people, okay, and we run into this fraction of a person here, just round that up. Let's just be, let's just be nice to people everywhere. Let's not treat anybody like a fraction. I know this is kind of a goofy place for that kind of a political statement here, but just round it up if it's a person. But if it's fish, feel free to round it down. That's fine. Who cares? All right, next question. A sample of bacteria doubles every five hours. So what is the initial count of bacteria? So, okay, so that's T1. We're looking for T1. If after 30 hours, there are 24,768 cells. Okay, a lot going on here. Let's take a look at our formula. So, well, we know, we know that we've got this, this uh, 24,768. That is where we're going to end up. Now, we're looking for where we started. That's my T1 here. I also know that I'm doubling The question is, what's the exponent? What's the n? Now, we are told that we're waiting 30 hours, but that's, that's not n. n is not 30, okay? Because we're told that a sample of bacteria doubles every five hours. It doesn't double every hour. It doubles only every five hours. So from our starting point right here, this is where T1 is. From our starting point on, this is basically our, our first term here. Five hours later, okay, is our second term. Then 10 hours, so this is five hours, this is going to be 10 hours. Okay, that's our th uh, third term. 15 hours is our fourth. Now, 
Oh, I'm hoping that you're seeing exactly where I'm going here even before I get there. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to build this out for you just so that you see it. This is going to be 20, 25, and way out here, here's our 30. Okay? So fourth term, fifth, sixth, that's the seventh term. We are looking for the seventh term. Now, don't, don't mistake me. I know if you take 30 and divide by 5, you're going to get 6. And so there's this, this idea that, wait, 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 sixth is important. Isn't it the sixth term we're looking for? No, it's not. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, six five-hour blocks that go by. But remember, when we count these things out here, that very first instant, that's what we call our first term. So don't, don't mistake those. Don't confuse those with the number of blocks Okay, with the term number in the sequence that we get here. This is actually the seventh term in the sequence. Now it turns out that is going to end up giving me a six up there anyway. However, if you're, if you're not careful with this, you might assume that n is six and then put a five up there. and That, that would be incorrect. So we've got 24,768 and we're going to divide that by two to the six to get our t1. And it turns out that the first term in that sequence, okay, the initial number of bacteria was 387. Okay, just a couple more. Whoa, there we go, foggy and now we're in. Okay, on the first weekend, the popular movie was shown, uh, 15,000 people attended. Now after that, only 48% of the previous week attend. Now, 48% is what shows up. It's not what we've lost, it's what actually shows up. So that's actually right there. Right now, I can see that what my R value is. Okay, and they watch on a subsequent weekend. The theater stops showing the movie when the attendance drops below 360. So how many weekends did the movie play at the theater? Okay, so we've got Tn is equal to T1 times R to the N minus 1. Well, I already know we started with 15,000 uh, people. That is that weekend number one. Now, so how many weekends did the movie play? Okay, so that's okay. This is weekend number one. Now, we already know that we're going to keep 48% of that number every week. And I know that at some point here we're going to get down to 360. What I don't know is how many weekends that's going to take to, to go by here. Uh, okay, so I got to solve for n here. Now, I, because of like the decimal that's showing up here, I have a sneaking suspicion I'm going to have to use my calculator and graph this out. But before I do that, I'm going to divide both sides here by that 15,000. Okay? And when I do that, uh, I'm going to get 360 over 15,000. That's going to simplify down to 3 over 125. It's going to equal 0.48. Uh, to the n minus 1. Okay, uh, well, golly, I have, I have no idea how that's supposed to be related here. So let's go to our calculator. I'm going to graph both sides of that equation there. So on my first side, I'm going to graph 3 divided by 125. It's going to be a really, really small number here. So I'm going to have to kind of zoom in on this. And then on the right-hand side, I'm going to put 0.48 to the power of x minus 1. Now, when I go to my window, I, I don't need it to be, uh, I don't need it to be negative values for x. I need positive values for x. But I don't know how far it's going to go up here. But I also know that I, I need uh, positive values for y. But I know I'm dealing with really small values of, of y here. So I'm going to put that as, uh, as 1 here. And that's probably even going to be way too high. Let's just take a look and see what I get there. there. Look at that, way down at the bottom there. But there comes my graph. Oh, and it looks like they do cross right there. So I can actually see the point where they cross. So that's good. That's fine. So I'm going to press second trace. And I'm going to look for the point of intersection. So the calculator drops me into the middle of the screen. Am I on the first curve? Yes. Press enter. Did I jump to the second curve? Yes. Press enter. Is it okay to make this as my guess? Yeah, press enter, go ahead. And I get that the x-coordinate 
is going to be 6.08155. Da, da, da. Oh, sorry, you can't see that. Now, interesting, interesting question. How many weekends did this thing show for? Well, this is telling me that, sorry, I should say N here. N is equal to this. Now, it would be very easy to say six weekends, but actually that's incorrect. Because what happened here, bear in mind that I get 360 people on the 6.08 weekend. So I still had enough people to run it on the sixth weekend. I, it didn't drop below 360 on the sixth weekend. On the seventh weekend is when it drops below 360, and then that's when we stop it. So therefore, this is going to go one more weekend, and then that's when it's going to quit. So you're going to have to round that up here. That's an interesting question. Okay, I like that little bit of extra thinking that they got to do when you look at your answer here and and try to make it match up with with what the question says. That's great. That's that's good math. Okay, one more. A clever child convinced his mother to only give him a penny, okay, that's one cent, for his allowance. But she would have to double it each week. So how much allowance would he receive on the 30th week? Okay, well, let's take a look at this. So Tn is equal to T1 R to the N minus 1. Now, we know that this child, this clever child, is only getting a penny to start off with, but that it's doubling. And this time we're going to do it on the 30th week, okay? Now, the way this is worded, I, I appreciate how this is worded here. It doesn't say 30 weeks later on the 30th week. So we are, the way this is worded here, the very first weekend when he gets his, his uh, one cent allowance, that's being counted as, as week one. So we can, Plug in 30 for n. So 30 minus 1 there. All right, let's take a quick look here. So 0 0.01 multiplied by 2 to the power of, that's going to be 29. Oh my goodness. 5, 3, 6, 8, 7, 0, 9.12. So in the 30th week, this child got. A little under five and a half million dollars for allowance. Now, some of you probably had a really good idea where that was going, and you knew that was going to get large quickly. But others of you might not have realized that that was that that was coming. That is the power of doubling. Okay, uh, it's it's unbelievably quick after a while. It starts off pretty slow. Okay, doubling. You go from one penny, two pennies, four pennies eight pennies. I mean, you go for several weeks before you even crack a buck, but then it, it starts to skyrocket really, really quickly here. It's really, really good mathematics. Anyway, I hope that helps you understand geometric sequences.